Ezekiel chapter 19. As you guys can hear, my voice is a little bit, a little bit rough this morning. I caught a cold last week, and then it, it, it knocked me down Monday and Tuesday. Um, but we're going to finish off this thing in Ezekiel chapter 19 today. Uh, we've been four weeks in Ezekiel, and uh, uh, I'm fighting this cold. And I get to the staff meeting on Wednesday, and you know, I'm kind of leading the thing but coughing, and then I'm kind of complaining a little bit. And if you don't know Dave Norvell, Dave Norvell is one of the elders here at the church, um, and he was previously with the fire department for a long time, and he just recently retired. Um, maybe within the last two, three months, Dave retired. And I'm kind of whining about it a little bit and complaining, and he says, you know what the, uh, the guys at the fire, fire department do when they get a cold? I was like, no, what do they do? He says, they, they take triactin. I was like, triactin? What's triactin? He says, triactin like a man. <laughs> and he zinged me. He zinged me good. And so here I am this morning. I'm going to try acting like a man. Um, <clears throat> suck it up. Um, but anyway, as we look at this, we do kind of see that, that when God talks to us, he, wants us he, he does want us to recognize that that we have a role and we have a responsibility in our relationship with him. There is an adult aspect of relationship with God where he wants us to stand up and he wants us to look him in the eye and recognize the wrong that's within us and recognize what he has done to reconcile us and bring us back into relationship with him. And as we've gone through this, we've talked about how uh, there's the, the train wreck of humanity. And so the question I have on, on your handout there is, what is God's promise to establish a kingdom or a nation that administers peace and justice? Because you look around the world, and there have been some, the United States did it pretty well. Um, I don't know how well we do it anymore. Um, but, but it's always temporary. You know, even, even the greatest nations that have done the best things for God, they've only been temporary. They've never lasted. <laughs> And so what will end the train wreck of humanity once and for all? And I want to I give you guys some context that you might not have otherwise. If, if the Old Testament is not a place where you go and read, um, you may not understand some of this stuff. And so 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, God speaks to the prophet Nathan, and he gives a message to give to King David. Now, King David ruled about 350, 360 years before the time of Ezekiel. And it was the golden age of the nation. Um, it was as good as Israel had ever been, okay? Um, and he makes this promise to, to David. He says, Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from a pasture, from following the sheep, to be a ruler over my people of Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies before you, and I will make you a great name, like the names of the great men who are on the earth." I will also appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them, that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed, nor will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly. Even from that day that I commanded the judges to be over my people uh, Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies, the Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make, you a, house, uh, will make a house for you. When your days are completed, you will lie down with your fathers, and I will rise up your descendant after you, who will come forth for you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and he will establish a throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and with the strokes of the son of men, sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. And so this promise is made to David that, that, that from his descendants is going to come one who's going to establish God's kingdom forever. Um, no end to it. It will always be. And this promise would have been something that the people of Ezekiel would have known. They would have understood this. Now, <coughs> pardon me, the book of the law was lost for a while. And so the, the Jewish people, they sort of lose sight of what God is doing with them. And then Josiah, the, the king, he finds the book of the law. He reads it. And if you read in 2 Kings chapter 23 and 24, you see all the things that Josiah does. He finds the book of the law at the end of chapter 22 in 2 Kings. And then 20, 2 Kings chapter 23 lists all the things that he does. And he tears down all the idols. And he, 
and not just the idols, but the people who were the people who were setting them up and, and putting worship there. It says that he he killed these priests and actually burned their bones on their old altars. It was like here is the death of this stuff. We're not doing this anymore. Very serious. And then he establishes they have a. Um, the, uh, the Passover is observed for the first time in forever. And so the promises that God is doing, uh, or that God had made, are being remembered. They're being remembered. And people like Ezekiel would have known this promise of what God said to David, that this Davidic line from the lineage of David was going to come somebody who was going to rule and reign forever. And that would have been part of the message that they shared, is look at what God is promising to us. And when we get to Ezekiel chapter 19, this thing happens where... Um, Ezekiel actually writes a funeral song. This, this, this chapter is a funeral song for the Davidic line. It's a funeral song for the nation of Judah. Um, he actually writes it before they're dead. Now, that wouldn't be very nice. If somebody wrote your funeral song before you were dead, you'd be like, hey, take it easy. You know, I'm still here. Um, but that's what he does. And he's going to go through some of the last kings of some of the last kings of Judah. And so, if you want to show it, yeah, you've got Josiah. He reigned 31 years. Um, and then, then there's, there's, there's Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, uh, Jehoachin, and Zedekiah. Um, and uh, what he's going to do is he's going to reference three of those five kings in this chapter. He's going to tell us something about three of those five kings in this chapter. And so, let me leave that up, but, but let me read this to you while we, while we do this. So, verses, uh, let me read the chapter. Verse 1. As for you, take up a lamentation for the princes of Israel and say, what was your mother? A lioness among lions. She lay down among young lions. She reared her cubs. But when she brought up one of her cubs, and this is speaking of, <coughs> pardon me, Jehoahaz, he became a lion and he learned to tear his prey. He devoured men's. The, na men, the, the nations heard about him. He was captured in their pit. And they brought him with hooks to the land of Egypt. This is what happened to Jehoahaz. Just three, year, three months into his reign, he gets removed. When she saw, as she waited, that her hope was lost, she took another of her cubs, and this is Jehoachin, and made, and made him a young lion. And he walked about among the lions, and he became a young lion. He learned to tear his prey. He devoured men. He destroyed their fortified towers and laid waste to their cities, and the land and its fullness were appalled because of the sound of his roaring. Then nations set against him on every side from their provinces, and they spread their net over him, and he was captured in their pit. They put him in a cage with hooks and brought him to the king of Babylon. So they brought him in hunting nets so that his voice would be heard no more on the mountains of Israel. And so there's a description of his short reign before Nebuchadnezzar comes and pulls him away. This next section, and one of the kings is skipped here. So Jehoiakim gets skipped. He reigned for 11 years, um, and he, get, he gets skipped in Ezekiel's description here. And so this next section is about Zedekiah, the current king, when Ezekiel writes this. Your mother was like a vine on a vineyard planted by the waters. It was fruitful and full of branches because of abundant waters. He's talking about the nation. And it had strong branches fit for scepters of rulers. And its height was raised above the clouds, so that it was seen in its height with the masses of its branches. But it was plucked up in fury. It was cast down to the ground. An east wind dried up its fruit. Its strong branch was torn off, and so that it withered. The fire consumed it. And now it's planted in the wilderness in a dry and thirsty land. The fire has... <coughs> Pardon me. Fire has gone out from its branches. It has consumed its shoots and fruit, so that there is not in it a strong branch, a scepter to rule. This is a lamentation and has become a lamentation. And so Ezekiel spells out that uh, he spells out some of what has already happened with the first two kings there that he that he talks about with Jehoahaz and Jehoachin. He, he brings out that their, their short reign that took place and how they ruled and that it was a terrifying rule. Um, and if you read about these, these guys, what they did to the nation of Israel was, uh, or to the nation of Judah, to the city of Jerusalem was just, they just, they didn't look after its best. They thought maybe they were, but really what they did is they just sold themselves to other nations. So they have an interaction with Pharaoh Necho, and, the, and Necho, he says, I'll let you go, uh, and I'll let you rule, but you're going to pay me a bunch of silver and a bunch of gold. And so they do it. Okay, fine. 
and, and, and if you'll protect us. And then that protection doesn't come through. And Babylon then comes in. And, and, the, and you just have this ongoing thing of a king who doesn't really know how to rule and a nation that's losing its grip. And what, what, what Ezekiel is saying here is that as, as the reason behind this is because you, you don't know who God is. You don't know who he is or how you're supposed to have relationship with him. Your nation is losing its grip because you do not know God. And it's very clear that that's what's going on. And so Ezekiel writes this funeral song for the nation and for the Davidic line. And so these people, they feel like perhaps, perhaps they're, the promises of God uh, the promises of God are there, but they're, I can't really grab it. I can't really touch it. I can't really understand it. Their children, much like the children that Tim is interacting with in schools, uh, their children are not raised in a, pla in a house where, where, the, where the law, where, the, where God and, and the God of the Bible are made real. And so you have this population, this group of people who they, they, don't, know, they don't know God. They're supposed to be his people, but, but they don't know him. And the nation loses hold and loses hold. Eventually, and it's conquered. And so what you get this picture of is that once upon a time, there was this group of people who knew God. They had a, they had a knowledge of who he was through his word, and they could relate with him, and they, they had an ability to share him with others as well. But time goes by, and the comforts of the world become more alluring than God himself. And the things that, this is what we read about just a few chapters ago, the things that God gave them became what they worshipped rather than him. And they fall into the trap that all humanity always falls into. They worship the creation rather than the creator, and they make up false gods. Their gods had names, um, and, and they, they had practices. We don't usually give our gods names anymore, but there are these false gods that we worship, and they're based upon not the creator, but the creation, and usually ourselves. And as this nation falls into this, they just fail again and again and again. Time after time, the promise is lost. And so there's this people that they're called out to be different. They're called out to be a light, to be a witness. They're called out to reach the nations around them. And instead, they look, they look, they look worse than the nations around them. They're intended to be something where God would be seen, and instead they're just this, this group of hypocrites. They're this group of people who don't actually do what God has called them to do. And they lose their nation because of it. There's this group of people who are supposed to be a light. There's this group of people who are supposed to be a witness. There's this group of people who are supposed to show those around them who God is, and they worship the creation rather than the creator. They worship what's easy and comfortable rather than what's right and challenging. And they lose their nation because of it. There's this people that's supposed to be a light. There's this people that's supposed to be a witness. There's this people that's supposed to reach out to their neighbors and show who God is. There's this people who are given mouths to speak with and the words to speak and the very presence of God within them. And they worship what's easy and comfortable rather than what's right and good and they lose their nation because of it. I think you could figure that out. I want to read to you from Luke chapter 1. There's this passage in Luke chapter 1 that describes John the Baptist, 74 through 79. Um, it, it's, it's talking about what, what God is going to do with John the Baptist it says, grant to us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear. Grant us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear. In holiness and righteousness before him all our days. 
and you, child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of God, which in the sunrise from on high will visit us, to shine upon us those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. You see, John the Baptist, he got it. He understood that this is what I was created for. <clears throat> that, that I was created to have relationship with God and then to move outside of where I am. And, and there's a time of preparation that he has. He spends time in the wilderness. But when his time comes, he's not going to hold back. He's going to let everybody know who God is and what God is doing. He's not going to hold back. He's going to love people, but he's going to say, the Lord has a path for each and every one of us. The Lord has a path to relationship with him, to salvation, for forgiveness of sins. And I'm not going to bite my tongue on this one, but I'm going to go and I'm going to share it. And I think one of the things that we've lost within the American church is we're all John the Baptists. Every single one of you who proclaims faith in Jesus Christ was given a mouth and words to speak. He's given you a life to live that would glorify him and a mouth with words to speak with which you would bring forth who he is to those who do not know him. You look at the numbers of the people that are willing to share the gospel within the Christian faith and it's disgusting. But John says, or he says of John, in 2 Kings, let me go back to Luke. Grant us that we, being rescued from our enemies, might serve him without fear. There's this mentality that exists within the church that, that it's somebody else's job. Somebody else will share. Somebody else will speak. Somebody else will, somebody else, somebody else, somebody else, somebody else. It's not what it's supposed to be. And so... My suggestion is let's not be a group of people who have the word of God, who have the spirit of God, who have the ability to speak forth who God is and his way of salvation and not care about these valleys around us. You guys know the numbers in the valleys around us? I read another study this week. The numbers were better, but they were still bad. It was 77% of people within our, within our valleys don't have a church home or relationship with God. I've seen numbers as high as 90, 94%. The mentality that it's somebody else's job to share the gospel is unacceptable. He has given us a mouth. He's given us the words. The Spirit of God resides within us. And so we should be able to proclaim <coughs> with our lives and with our words, that God desires relationship. So this Davidic line, it goes forward, right? It does move forward. It doesn't actually die. But there's a resurrection of it, and we find it in Jesus Christ, that through, uh, through, through Joseph and Mary, Jesus Christ is born, and he's of, this, of the Davidic line. He is, his descendants, he, his descendants, he is a descendant of David. And God does what he promises to David through Jesus Christ. He, he, he raises up this one who his, his kingdom is established and will be established forever. There's a spiritual aspect to it right now where God's kingdom exists within the church. And he, 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 has, he, has, a, he has a kingdom of priests who are called to proclaim the marvels of those who have brought them out of darkness and into his light. That's what we exist to do to glorify him, to make him known, to share the gospel. <clears throat> but it goes forward even farther than that. And in Revelation chapter 21, we get to the end of Revelation, and it describes what God is going to do, what the new heavens and the new earth will look like. There's these verses, and it spells out, this is what God is going to do. This is where he's drawing all people towards is this relationship with him. And so God makes this promise to David through the prophet Nathan. And the people wait for it and wait for it. In Ezekiel's time, they think it's never going to happen. <clears throat> Ezekiel looks at it and he goes, these people whose God has called out to be different, who God has called out to be a light, to be a witness. They've worshipped what's easy and comfortable in the creation rather than their God, and they lose their nation. 
Then some 600 years later, Christ shows up. God brings forward the Messiah that he promised. And this Messiah, he lives a perfect life and he shows us the exact representation of God and he leads us in ways that we would never pick on our own. And he shows us exactly how he wants us to live. And he dies this death and, and there in... in uh, in 2 Samuel, it says that, that he was going to correct him with the rod of men for his iniquity. Well, we know that, or that Jesus didn't die for his iniquity, but he died for taking on ours. And he puts himself in this position where he says, I'll be your substitute. I'll take your, I'll take your pain. I'll take the death that you deserve. I'll die on your behalf. That's the message of the gospel. That God loves you so much that he's willing to lay down his life for you. He's willing to substitute himself for you. But it goes much further than that. It goes much further than that because he institutes a, a new way of relationship with him. And he gives us direct access to him. And he allows us to, to speak directly to him. And he writes his laws on our hearts. And we begin to want what he wants. And he, he just transforms us into these brand new people. But these brand new people who have a purpose and, and a new identity. And part of that identity is he says, you're my ambassadors. You're my priests. I put you here to go. And as you go... I want you to teach them everything that I've said and I want you to make disciples and I want you to baptize them and I want you to do it all in relationship with me through the power of the Holy Spirit because I'll be with you. And that's where we live right now. We live in this place where we long and we dream of what we just sang or had sung to us there about Revelation chapter 21 where God will bring all human history to fruition. He'll bring it to its, its right ending. And all those who love him and have relationship with him will enter into that kingdom. The, the problem with it is, is what's missed here, guys, and this, the song didn't sing it probably because it, it didn't want to go to this place. But it finishes up in verse 8 and it says, But the cowardly and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and immoral perser, persons and sorcerers, idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I don't know about you, but the idea of somewhere between 77 and 94% of the people that I run into today, um, that being their end, that doesn't set well with me. Now God's in control and he's going to do what's right and I trust him. But I'm pretty sure we have a part to play here. So close your eyes and pray with me. Lord God, I would like to, at least on my behalf and maybe everyone else's, I would like to repent from the idea, do a 180 from the idea that because evangelism is hard and because I'm not sure how to do it, I don't have to. That is an idea that should not exist with any Christian. There'll be those of us that are gifted better at it than others. There'll be those of us that you've given a platform that others will never have. But each and every person in this room who has placed faith in Jesus Christ is your ambassador. They are your priest and they are called to proclaim your excellencies. They're called to share the story. I am called to share the story of how you have pulled me out of darkness and brought me into your light. That when I hear the song that was just sung, those words in Revelation chapter 21, I don't think that's some fairy tale. I believe that you are truly going to bring that about. Because I've tasted and I've walked in relationship with you. And when you make a promise, I have no doubt that it will come about. So God, give us that kind of confidence. Give us the kind of confidence that John the Baptist had where he said, I'm going to go and I'm going I'm to proclaim it. And, and may we do it without fear. No fear of repercussions. What a co-worker might say, what a family member, how a family member might respond. But instead, God, that we would do what you've called us to do, that we would be who you've called us to be. God, I pray that you would do a mighty work in these communities around us and that you would use this church to do it. That as we look forward at the next five years, that what we see is a hill to climb that is filled with a generation of people who do not even have the slightest clue who you are and they need to know your name. They need to know what you've done. 
God, I pray that you give us a desire and a vision to go climb the hill where we share the gospel, we share the good news of who you, who you are with the hurting and lost. That we remember who you've made us and your, the identity that you've given us and that your spirit dwells within us and that we're not going to go do this on our own. Who'd want to do that? But God, I pray that the next five years we would do something crazy and reach even just half a percent of those who don't know you in these valleys. And God, I pray that you would give this desire to multiple churches in these valleys, that we would, that we would get, that we would, that the community would once again know the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and what you've done, and that many, many would repent and believe based upon your goodness, your kindness, your love. May we proclaim you without fear and not, not have to experience anything even remotely like what Ezekiel saw in his time when a people who were called to be yours trusted more in what was easy and comfortable than they did in you. Call us out. May we repent from any mentality that seeks ease over your kingdom. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.